I'm starting a new series this morning that I'm very, very much looking forward to. This series has been brewing in me, I want to say, for years. Now, there's a sense in which what I'm going to do in this series, I do each and every week. Um, but I've never really devoted an entire series to what I'm about to do. Uh, it will be seven weeks. It will lead us right up until Christmas. Um, and we're going to be looking at a variety of different verses, passages in the Bible that have been taught one way or that I have heard taught one way growing up, um, or even today is still taught in a particular way that would lead us to believe that the focus of the Christian faith is the life of the Christian. And when that becomes the focus, when that becomes the message, it's very enslaving and burdensome. Uh, and there are a lot of places in the Bible that imply that that's the case. But when you look a little bit closer, you realize that's not what it's saying at all. Um, and so I have, I think, selected four of the seven. So if you have any ideas, I've actually gotten a handful of recommendations from you guys, which I greatly appreciate, both people locally and people who watch online. Uh, so if you have any, if there are those passages or Bible verses that have confused you over the years because they seem to indicate that God's love for us is conditional or that we have to do certain things to garner God's love, then send those to me. Um, and they might make the final cut. Who knows? Um, but this morning, I want to look at Matthew chapter 7. I wanted to launch with this one because uh, I have made the mistake on numerous occasions of teaching and preaching this particular passage wrongly. In fact, I grabbed off of our bookshelf the other day my first book that I wrote. It was called Do I Know God? And I wrote it when I was 36 years old. Don't write a book when you're 36 years old, because then when you're 51, you realize how much you disagreed with yourself, okay? Um, so I picked it up because I knew that I had addressed this passage in that book. And I was sure, convinced that however I addressed it was wrong, and sure enough, I butchered it. So uh, I have proof of my own transgressions in print still after all these years. Um, if I didn't get, you know, $12 a year royalty checks still, I would ask for them to put it out of print. But regardless. Okay, so I want to look at Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, 21 to 23. This, this, uh, this passage comes at the very end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' famous Sermon on the Mount, which we looked at that entire sermon a couple series ago, I think. Maybe, I don't remember when it was, but it was sometime in the last year. Matthew chapter 7. This is Jesus speaking, beginning in verse 21. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We performed many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. Haunting, haunting verses. My dad, as many of you know, was a psychologist and he used to say that the only thing worse than no counseling is bad counseling. He used to say that he would run into people all the time who recognized their own need for therapy, but then would go to a therapist, and that therapist would really jack them up with some bad counsel. So he said the only thing worse, he was a huge proponent of therapy, by the way, uh, and thought that every human being, because we are broken people living in a broken world with other broken people, that every human being should be in some sort of ongoing therapy, um, whether professionally or just in groups with friends and people who know us and love us, uh, that we all need therapy. But he was also quick to say that the only thing worse than no therapy is bad therapy, that bad counseling messes people up worse. Well, the same can be applied to the Bible. The only thing worse than being totally unfamiliar with what it says is reading it wrongly, 
The Bible is one place where God reveals himself to us, where he speaks to us. And if we are twisting his words, it'll jack us up. If we don't hear him the way he wants us to hear him, it will mess us up. It will really jack us up. I mean, the Bible understood wrongly can do some serious damage to people. A lot of the people that I interact with on a weekly basis, both locally and non-locally, are people who have deep, haunting questions about God because they were taught something about God from the Bible that is just simply not true because it was mistaught. And so I wanted to do a series on verses or passages that have been mistaught and resulted in real damage being done to our understanding of who God is and how God relates to us, hence the title, Misled. Um, I was going to call it, you've heard it said, but I tell you, stealing Jesus's line from the Sermon on the Mount. Throughout the Sermon on the Mount, he would say, you've heard it said, but I tell you, you've, you've heard it said, but, but I tell you over and over again in that sermon, Jesus turned right side up everything the religious teachers had taught about God. He showed over and over and over that what they had taught about God was wrong. So I wanted to do something similar because, like I said, I encounter a lot of people who have been taught wrongly about God and they've used the Bible to do it. Um, I was taught that the Bible was basically an instruction manual from God on how to live right. Okay, so... I think it was probably in Sunday school where I first heard that the Bible, B-I-B-L-E, stands for basic instructions before leaving earth. Okay, have you heard that before? I I learned that in Sunday school. And so what I came away with was this idea that the Bible was basically God's instruction manual to us. It was an instruction manual from God on how to live right. So I just assumed that God was primarily interested in me being good, in me doing the right thing, flying straight and keeping the rules, that that's what God was primarily interested in. And if I didn't do those things, then there'd be hell to pay which is what the verses I just read seem to imply. So that's the way I taught it after growing up and then going to college and seminary and then emerging from their preaching and teaching. That's the way, since that's the way I was taught, that's the way I taught it. Every message, and I feel so bad for those poor people who heard some of my earliest sermons, because every message was about how to live a better life for God how to be more sacrificial, how to be more obedient, how to be more faithful, how to be more serious, how to be more committed, how to be more spiritually disciplined. Because this is what I was taught, I concluded that, like I said a minute ago, that the focus of the Christian faith was the life of the Christian. And so when my good friend John Frost dragged me kicking and screaming onto the radio back in the mid-2000s where my sermons were broadcasted. I called uh, called my radio program Godward Living. It was all about living right for God, flying straight for God. Well, what's even worse is that I'd cause people to doubt that they were right with God if they weren't living a more faithful life. A life wholeheartedly devoted to God in in every way, all the time. I would say things like, look at everything God has done for you. In order for you to know that you are a Christian, your life has to look like this. You have to be committed, devoted, flawless in your faithfulness. I used to say, and this is true, that there's a huge difference between knowing about God and knowing God. That's a true statement. There's a huge difference between knowing about God and knowing God. But then, after saying that, I'd tell them that the only way they can know that they know God is by looking at their lives. 
Are you fighting sin daily? Are you hungering and thirsting for God more than anything else? Are you spending time with God in prayer and Bible reading? Are you obeying God? Are you giving sacrificially? Are you getting better? All of these diagnostic questions that would cause people to look in rather than out and up, I would cause them to look in. When someone would ask me what a Christian is, I would always quote two verses. Psalm 42, as a deer pants after the water brooks, so my soul pants after you, O God. If you want to know whether or not you're a Christian, you have to ask yourself, does my soul pant after God? And I would also quote 1 Corinthians 10, 31. How do you know you're a Christian? Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. That's how you can know. I read a sentence the other day from a very well-known preacher that made me throw up in my mouth. Uh, partly because I used to say things like this, uh, and partly because it's just completely false. He said, obedience is the only possible proof that you know God. Well, how much obedience? I mean, if that's the standard, then how do I know I've obeyed enough? Well, that can be settled very quickly when you look at what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5. So therefore, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Perfection is the standard, not progress. Not I'm a little bit better today than I was yesterday. That doesn't cut it. Perfection is the requirement. Perfection is the standard. And anything short of perfection is failure. So when I read sentences like that, obedience is the only possible proof that you know God, I always want to say, how much obedience? Because my obedience is half-assed at best all the time. I mean, I'm a mixed bag. I'm, I'm, I have mixed motives all the time. Even my best demonstrations of love are mixed with impure motives. I want to get something back. I want something in return. I may not even be conscious of that stuff. But whatever it is, it falls far short of perfection. Well, there was a time when I believed that obedience is the only possible proof that you know God. And one of my go-to passages was Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. This grave warning to people that not everybody who says they know God actually know God. And I would go to this, these verses time and time again as a way of soberly warning people that if they weren't striving for deeper obedience, cultivating a deeper faithfulness, that they might go through life believing that they're in with God and then find out on that last day that they didn't know him at all and they're cast away from him. I mean, those are some scary verses. If you want, if you want to employ guilt manipulation in your sermons, these are perfect verses to go to and butcher to scare people to death, to literally scare the hell out of them. Um, so I, I used these verses to warn people that obeying God is no joke, that lip service Christianity is a matter of life and death, and that if we're not serious about obedience, we're screwed. Obeying God with your whole heart was how you could know that you know and not hear those words, depart from me, I never knew you. If you want to be certain that you'll never hear that, fly straight all the time. I never knew you. That is a, uh, that is a, a pregnant phrase, pregnant with a tremendous amount of fear and haunting. In fact, C.S. Lewis, C.S. Lewis um, talked about that phrase, and he said, that's... That's being banished from the presence of him who is everywhere and erased from the knowledge of him who knows all. Scary, super scary. None of us want to find ourselves 
in that spot. I was taught that these verses are about people who say they're Christians, but don't do what God says. I mean, after all, he says right here, only those who do the will of my Father will in heaven will enter. Only those who do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. So it stands to reason that these verses are about people who say they're Christians but don't do what God says. In other words, the only way for you to know that you're safe and sound with God is to do his will. But what is the will of God that Jesus is talking about? That's the $10,000 question. We assume that doing the will of God is our morality or our obedience or our faithfulness or our good behavior, but is this what Jesus means? Now, if you look a little closer at these verses, you'll see that the people he's describing are people who are banking on what they've done. Lord, I did this in your name. I did that in your name. These are people who have gone through life with a high degree of confidence that their doing for God would get them in. The people he's describing are people who are counting on their moral activity and betterment to make themselves right with God. Clearly, that's what he's describing. He's not describing people who do too little. He's describing people who do too much, actually. People who think that busyness for God equals righteousness. That's who he's describing. Remember the rich young ruler, one of my favorite passages in all the Bible? This young guy who had amassed a tremendous amount of wealth sees Jesus, approaches him, and says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He was making an assumption that there were certain things he could do to inherit eternal life, to garner God's grace. His question, as I've mentioned before, is religious to the core. It comes very natural to us. What must I do? Well, Jesus here is describing people who are shocked, shocked that God will not accept them based on their hard work for God and good rule keeping. They assumed, these people that he's describing in Matthew 7, they assumed, like many people, that God will love me if I'm good. God will love me if I obey. I will inherit eternal life if I do the right things and clean myself up. But Jesus' warning here, his point here, is that there's nothing you can do. In fact, it's our confidence in our doing that created this mess. Jesus actually came to undo everything we've done. So banking on our doing, putting confidence in our doing, Paul elsewhere refers to this as putting confidence in the flesh, confidence in our own ability, confidence in our own morality, confidence in our own capacity to keep the rules, to do the right thing all the time in hopes that God will love us and accept us as a result. Um, but back to the question of what is the will of God? Because clearly he says here, not all of you are going to be welcomed. Only those who do the will of God will be welcomed. So, so what is the will of God? That seems to be a rather important question so that we don't find ourselves uh, deceived on that last day. I mean, what, what is the will of God? That seems to be the ticket in. So what is it? Well, to answer that question, we have to look at John chapter 6. What must we be doing to be doing the will of God? Um, I have it here, so I'm going to read it. John chapter 6. I, I read it again twice this morning. Listen to what he says here, if I can find it. I tweeted it, so I just have to go on Twitter or X to find out what it says. Okay. John chapter 6. Verses 28 and 29, they, Jesus' disciples, replied, we want to perform God's works too. 
What should we do? That question, we always ask that question. What, what should we be doing, God? Tell us what to do. Show us what to do. Jesus responded to them, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. That's it. I mean, this was a very anticlimactic response from Jesus to his disciples. They ask him, what, what must we be doing to be doing the works of God? What must we be doing to be doing the will of God? And they're, they're ready. They're ready for Jesus to give them a checklist of things they can do. And instead, in a very anticlimactic way, he simply says, the only thing God wants from you is to believe in the one whom he has sent. That's it. And elsewhere, he goes on to say that the belief that God wants from you is itself a gift from God. So even the believing part doesn't come from you. It comes from God. God is the one who gives faith, who opens eyes, gives us the trust and the belief that we need to know that he has paid it all and has done everything required to get us in with him. Uh, so as hard as it is to believe, this is what Jesus is saying, as hard as it is to believe, trust that all accounts have been settled for you. Trust that everything which needed to be done has been done for you so that there's nothing left for you to do, that you're safe and sound in God's love forever, not because of what you do, but because of what I have done for you. That's the will of God. Believe that. Believe that. Um, I, I posted something a number of months back about this, and I got a comment from somebody uh, who was, in essence, asking a question, a sincere question. A lot of the questions that people ask on social media aren't sincere, but this one was. Um, and I think it was a woman. She said, uh, I hear what you're saying, but I'm reminded of that verse in Revelation 3 that warns us not to be lukewarm. Doesn't that seem to imply, imply that we must be fiery hot for God in order to ensure that we're in with God? I mean, how do we relax and enjoy the gift yet not be considered lukewarm? Okay, have you heard that before? I mean, I heard that growing up. Uh, God wants you to be either hot or cold, but if you're lukewarm, he spits you out of his mouth, Revelation 3 says. So, I mean, that's pretty scary too. Um, so the question was sincere. It was a question that I know a lot of people probably ask. Uh, what about lukewarmness? And here was my answer to her. I said, lukewarmness is not what we think it is. We've been taught that being lukewarm means that we're fickle and weak and inconsistent. Uh, but the fact is, we are all of those things all of the time. So he must be describing something else. Lukewarmness and the lukewarmness he's describing in Revelation 3 is trusting that somehow our doing is what gains God's favor. That's lukewarmness. Not the, if you're not reading your Bible for an hour a day and on fire for God and telling people all the time about Jesus and praying all the time and, you know, blah, blah, whatever. That If you're not doing that, you're lukewarm. I mean, I believed that as a young Christian and I burdened myself with heavy burdens that on those days when I was faithful in reading the Bible, journaling the Bible, praying, being kind and loving and patient, I was certain that God was pleased with me and liked me better on those days. And on those days when I slept late and didn't read my Bible and was frustrated with people all day long and my only prayers were imprecatory prayers, calling down curses on people who drive stupid on the road, on those days, I was convinced God liked me a lot less. That how I, my spiritual temperature um, and how I performed was the way God related to me. I believed that, and so I preached that. Um, 
But rather than these verses, Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23, rather than these verses warning people who aren't doing enough for God, these verses are actually warning people who are depending on their work to set them straight with God. That's what this is about. These verses aren't about being a more serious Christian by doing more for God. <laughs> Ironically, these verses are about being a more serious Christian by doing less for God. They aren't about working more. They're about resting more. Because every time I heard these verses or I taught these verses, the goal was to get the person hearing these verses to work harder, to do more, to prove yourself before God so that you could live in this life with assurance that God really knows you and loves you. And if that work is not going on inside of you, then you can be pretty sure that you're not in with God. And of course, the work was always defined subjectively, depending on who you were talking to. Uh, what kind of performance is required was always different, depending on who you were talking to. If you were talking to a Presbyterian, the kind of performance that was required was right doctrine, good theology. If you were talking to a Baptist, um, what it meant to perform well was no cussing, being in church, teaching Sunday school, doing the right thing, being nice to people, okay? Um, so it all depended on who you were talking to. It was, it was a very fluid word or phrase. What does it mean to get better? What does it mean to perform well? Um, but these verses aren't about performing more. In a sense, they're about performing less. They're not about working more, but resting more. That my assurance ultimately comes from the fact that God loves me. And believing that, not that I love God, but that he loves me. Not that my faithfulness is great for God, but that God's faithfulness to me is great. Um, so I want to I read something to you. Uh, that a friend of mine by the name of Chad Bird wrote a while back that I think is really well written, really well said, and very true. He said this, or he wrote this, if you look inside yourself to answer, are you a Christian, what will you find? You'll find a heart that is deceitful, selfish, unforgiving, prone to wander, a heart from which, according to Jesus in Matthew 15, flow evil thoughts and murder and adultery and sexual immorality and theft and false witness and slander, a conscience that testifies that even the things you know you shouldn't do, you keep on doing. If you look at your deeds to answer the question, or am I a Christian?, what will you find? Well, you'll find, like Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 64, you'll find that all your righteousness is as filthy rags. And if that's your righteousness, how dirty is your unrighteousness? So to answer, are you a Christian by looking inside yourself or by looking to your deeds is to drink the poison of doubt the more Christians look at themselves to see whether they are Christians, the more they will become convinced that they are not Christians. So if that's true, then how do you know that you know God? How do you know that God knows you? How can you live in this life with the assurance that you'll never hear those haunting words, depart from me, I never knew you. How, how can you know for certain? How do you know you're a Christian? Not because your heart is good and pure, but because the heart of Jesus pulses with a love for you that will never end. Not because your deeds are righteous, but because he has been righteous for you and covers you with that righteousness. Righteousness. 
believing that, believing in the one he has sent. Not because you have lived for him, but because he has lived and died and risen again for you. Not because you asked him to be your savior, but because while you were yet a sinner, Jesus died for you, chose you, called you, and washed you clean with his blood. It is God's grace and mercy that makes us right with God, not what we do. And I've shared this uh, illustration numerous times about the Lutheran pastor, the old Lutheran pastor who was on his deathbed and he looked at his wife and said, I'm absolutely certain that I'm going to heaven because I cannot remember one good work I've ever done. He's banking on the work of another. That's how he can know. Not because as you're laying there, you're recounting, okay, I was a pretty good person. I mean, yeah, I wasn't perfect, but I mean, I didn't kill anybody. I was faithful to my spouse. I loved my kids as best I could. I provided for them. I tried to be nice. I, I volunteered at church. I was generous with my giving. I mean, that, that is, how long is that list? It's like that funny story I told you about Peter showing up to heaven and the, I mean, uh, some guy showing up to heaven and Peter meets him there uh, and essentially says, you have to have a thousand points to enter. And this guy's like, well, I've never heard that before, but I think I'll do okay. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I was raised in a Christian home and I went to church every Sunday. And even as a little boy, I tithed 10% of whatever allowance I got. Um, I got married young, had children. I've been faithful to my wife all these years. I taught Sunday school. Two of my kids went off to seminary and they're preachers. One of them's in the, on the mission field. Uh, I mean, I've really, and he just goes through this long laundry list of a relatively good life. And Peter looks at him and says, okay, that's one point. What else have you done? <laughs> and the guy cries out and says, Lord, have mercy. And Peter says, that's it. You're in. That's the ticket in. It's God's mercy. It's God's grace that gets us in. It's God's work for us that gets us in. Not our work for him. That is an enslaving way to live. To think that I have to perform for my meal. That in order for me to be sure that I'm going to heaven when I die, I have to do the right things. I have to, I mean, I, yes, I understand this grace idea and how, you know, it, I don't have to be perfect, but I got to be, I got to be good. We lower the standard of God's requirements so low that we think we can actually jump over it. But when the standard is be perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect, and that it would be easier to jump from here to the moon than to do that, than to be perfect, when we let God's law crush us the way it was designed, that's when the good news of God's amazing grace blows through our minds and assures us that everything necessary has been done for you. Banking it all on what God has done for you and banking nothing on what you have done for God, that and that alone is what ensures that you'll never hear those haunting words, depart from me. I never knew you. Let's pray together.